The brand new ZW AM3N is here, a mount that promises to be an improvement over what I already thought was the perfect portable mount, the AM3. The N in AM3N stands for new, so the question is, what is actually new about it? Because at first glance, it looks identical to the old one. Today, we'll break this down, what's new, what stayed the same, and whether any of it actually matters out in the field. Let's get into it. My name is Lisa, and you're watching The Space Koala. If you have followed my content for a while, you already may know that I'm an absolute fan of harmonic mounts. I bought the original AM3 almost two years ago now when it first came out, and I've used it a lot since then. So when ZW announced the AM3N, of course, I was curious. I wanted to know what could possibly be new. When the AM5N came out, the updated version of the original AM5, it brought some new nice quality of life improvements like through the saddle cabling and better wireless connectivity via Bluetooth. Naturally, I expected something similar here, but since the original AM3 already had Bluetooth, I was curious what else ZW could possibly improve. Let's start with the basics, the physical form factor. Side by side, the AM3 and the AM3N look nearly identical. The same compact body, the same harmonic drive design, and the same signature red finish. So mechanically, the two mounts are identical. They're about four kilograms. That's about nine pounds for the head only. And they support a 13 kilogram payload with a counterweight and eight kilograms without. You still get the dual Vixen Lossman D saddle and the base still bolts to the same exact DC40 tripod with the same usual three screws. Where things start to differ a little bit is connectivity and power. So the AM3N inherits the AM5N's power saddle, meaning a USB-C data port as well as a 12 volt DC output directly on the saddle. So you can route power and data through the head instead of dangling cables. This through the saddle cabling is easily the most significant improvement over the original AM3. It simplifies setup and it reduces cable clutter and completely eliminates the risk of tangling or snagging during long slews or meridian flips. The AM3 still also has Wi-Fi in addition to Bluetooth, although for astrophotography, a lot of people prefer a wired connection whenever possible. But if you're using one of ZWO's ASI Airs or Air integrated cameras, the Bluetooth link can make for a very clean single cable setup. Another small improvement is you get this hex key now that magnetically attaches like almost inside the base of the mount. So you are supposed to use this for the altitude locking screws so that you can actually exert more torque to um, lock the altitude of the mount securely. And then the magnetic storage, it just ensures that you always kind of have it on you. Another change is that the operating range now extends from negative 20 degrees Celsius to positive 40 degrees, which previously only went down to negative 10 degrees, so it should handle cold winter nights a little bit better. So on paper, it behaves exactly like the AM3, just a little cleaner and better integrated but paper only tells a part of the story. So I took both mounts out for several nights of testing and tried to capture a few images along the way. To compare the two mounts fairly, I built two rigs that are as identical to each other as I could possibly do with what I have, both in terms of weight and imaging configuration. For the AM3N, I mounted my Ascar SQA55 refractor. On top of it, I used the ZWO ASI 2600mm Air which is the monochrome version of the all-in-one air camera. I chose this one because it directly supports wireless control of the mounts and that ties in perfectly with the wireless features of the AM3N. All of this is sitting on top of the ZWO TC40 carbon tripod, which is just the usual lightweight carbon tripod that they sell for all of their harmonic mounts. For the AM3, I mounted my SV Boney SV55 telescope, which is nearly identical to the Ascar, just with an ever so slightly shorter focal length, um, but likely not enough to have any impact on the guiding performance. On this setup, I used the ASI 2600MC Air, so that is the color version of the same exact camera. And again, it is connected to the mount via Bluetooth connection. 
So both mounts, both rigs were running under the same exact conditions at the same time, shooting the same target, with the only difference um, being that on the older TC40 tripod, I don't have the leg spreader that went missing a while ago, but I do not believe that it has any impact at such a uh, low payload. The plan was to shoot for multiple nights with both rigs from the same location. Some nights were shot from my very much light polluted city balcony under the full moon, and then some from under more ideal locations like this one. During one of those moonlit balcony sessions, I also took the opportunity to capture Comet C2026A6 Lemon with both telescopes. The idea was to use the monochrome setup for the luminance layer and then the color one for RGB data and then combine the two for a composite image. Uh, these little telescopes are of course way too small to show any nice detail near the head of the comet. I really wanted to photograph that particular event because the comet was passing close to a small background galaxy that night. The result was a clean wide field image showing a very long tail with a tiny galaxy near the nucleus. I also did several guiding tests on deep sky targets across the sky, some near the zenith, such as the one I took in Cygnus, and then others further north like in Cassiopeia, where guiding often becomes trickier. In both cases, I used HSO, so Hubble palette style narrowband imaging due to the current moon phase, putting a dual HO filter on the color camera and then using the sulfur filter on the mono camera and then I combined the data from both telescopes to create the Hubble palette composites. The goal of all of this was of course not to get perfect photos but to create equivalent imaging sessions that could reveal even subtle differences in the guiding behavior between the AM3 and the AM3N. To do this comparison, I actually use an app called PHD2 Log Viewer, which is a small but incredibly useful free tool that lets you load and analyze guiding logs from any session with PHD2, even those recorded through the ASI Air. It is available for all operating systems, so if you want to examine your own guiding data, I'll leave the download link below. Side by side, the result was exactly what I expected. Both performed essentially identically, only small night-to-night -night variations with no consistent trend. On average, both mounts stayed well below the one arc second total RMS error. In good conditions, both of them hovered around 0.5 to 0.6 arc seconds total, sometimes even a little bit better depending on the wind and seeing conditions. These are the expected results when using these little mounds and guiding at this focal length and, and proves that these little mounds are more than capable of supporting small to medium sized refractors. The fact that we don't find any significant difference between the performance of, of the two mounts makes perfect sense because the internal drive, the encoders and motors, they're all unchanged. So there's, there's no hidden performance upgrade, just the same performance as before. So throughout this, the only difference I noticed was not the precision, but just about the usability. I tried the cable pass through both ways. So both powering the mount and then powering the ASI air from the saddle. And then the other way around, which was powering the camera from the mains and then powering the mount through the saddle. Both of them worked just fine. I do prefer the first method. So powering the mount and then powering the ASI air from the mount just because it is even cleaner because you actually, you could tie this up here and then you get zero moving parts and you have a virtually zero chance of anything getting snagged anywhere. Realistically, um, but the rigs being so small, you wouldn't run a huge chance of cables getting snagged even with the old mount without the cable pass through. But there is just something visually satisfying about how clean this is now. So what does this all mean? If you already own an AM3, should you upgrade to the new AM3N? Realistically, in my opinion, you really don't need to. The guiding accuracy is the same, the payload capacity is the same, and the mechanical performance is identical. The AM3N is not truly a new mount, it is just a new iteration of an already admittedly excellent design. For new buyers though, this is great news because if you're on the market for a small portable harmonic mount right now, the AM3N simply 
replaces the older model with a few small enhancements. So if you're going to be buying one right now, make sure it is the new one. But if you already have the AM3, keep it. It is still an outstanding mount and you won't really gain any performance advantage by switching unless your current rig would truly benefit from that through the saddle cabling. The difference just simply isn't worth the upgrade. On a personal note, I actually really like the move to USB-C. I know not everyone agrees. I know some people just prefer sticking to the older, chunkier USB-B standard, but I think standardizing around USB-C is the right direction. For example, in the European Union, many devices are already required by regulation to use it, and such it should help to reduce the jungle of incompatible cables that we all end up carrying out in the field. So I'm all for this change. So for this comparison and test, I used these small telescopes because I wanted two nearly identical setups. But for regular use, I like to push my AM3 a little harder. I often pair it with my 8-inch RASA telescope, for example, which is a little bit over its comfort zone, but if you enable the low power mode, so that's just the slower slewing, um, it actually handles it perfectly with amazing guiding numbers and it is just so compact and so easy to drive around. It has become my go-to mount my go-to mount for um, going out in the field, especially to shoot comets where I often have to go to different locations because my horizon is so high everywhere. The portability and ease of setup with, along with the wireless connectivity just makes it way too comfortable for me not to use for my travel rig. So that's it really, that's the story here. The AM3 doesn't reinvent anything, it just makes an already travel-friendly mount a little cleaner, a little simpler, and with the new cable, a little more future-proof. Uh, this is my take, but let me know what you guys think. And also, by the way, if you have one of these mounts or the AM5N, um, do you actually use the wireless connectivity for astrophotography? Because I have this feeling that I'm one of the only people who actually use it, and most people still prefer cables because they just trust them more. Let me know about your thoughts. I will link the new mounts below if you want to check out the specs. But again, they are very, very similar to the old AM3. I hope you enjoyed this short comparison. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, 